you see. Now, I have a couple of uh, quotes here. One is from uh, uh, an ancient cynic uh, in the second century, and then another is from one of our first Christian apologists. And you'll see in both of these statements the, the shame of the cross. So the first one is by a fellow by the name of Celsus. Uh, he wrote in 177 AD, it says, But if Jesus was really so great, he ought, in order to display his divinity, to have disappeared suddenly from the cross. If he really was who he claimed to be, he certainly wouldn't have endured the shame. He would have disappeared from the cross, proved himself to be the God that you Christians say that you worship. Now Justin Martyr, uh, an apologist in the second century, says this, They say that our madness consists in the fact that we put a crucified man in second place after the unchangeable and eternal God, the creator of the world. So in other words, unbelievers in the ancient world are saying these Christians are absolutely out of their minds. They're mad. Because who would do this? Uh, finally, the, the last statement there, Joseph. The unlikelihood of Christianity being invented we're surviving in this context. Has actually led one scholar to write a book entitled, Why on Earth Did Anyone Become a Christian in the First Three Centuries? In other words, again, if you know the background and you know the culture of the first century, it's not only incredible to think that um, some of his closest disciples would continue to follow him, but that they could actually begin to convert others to this religion. Now I want you to think about the cross for a moment. The cross was an incredibly um, potent means uh, of punishment. Every revolt in the ancient Roman world was put down by the cross. Any false messiah, any rebellion, for instance, like the slave rebellion of Spartacus uh, back in around 70 BC, put down when uh, after the defeat of the slaves, they crucified 6,000 of those slaves. Guess what? In all of the rest of Roman history, there was never again a slave revolt. Crucifixion ended every uprising, every movement, because no one wanted to be identified with it. Every movement except for one. And so why? Why is it that the apostles were able to preach a crucified man and have the religion spread like wildfire across the Roman Empire? There's a piece of graffiti that Joseph has put up for you. Um, and Joseph, if you'll put up the, what it says underneath. This comes from like the second or third century uh, from Rome. And what it says in Greek, Alexamenos worships his God. You can see the scorn. It's almost embarrassing to put it up because I feel blasphemous. It's the picture of a man on a cross with a donkey's head. And this is how Jesus is being pictured. And this is how uh, the Greco-Roman world is looking at these Christians who would do such a ridiculous thing to worship a man who died on a cross. So this is what the early Christians faced. And when you realize this, you have to ask yourself the question then, how did this faith ever get started? How did it spread? And to me, there's only one logical explanation for it. It's the explanation of the Gospels, that the power of God was demonstrated in the resurrection itself, that the tomb was indeed empty, and that as the apostles uh, and early disciples went about spreading this message, it was confirmed by signs and wonders. So if you're making up a religion in the first century, let's say Jesus has died and the disciples are sitting around and they're like, man, we had our careers all planned out and uh, we were really looking forward to being part of this Jesus movement uh, and now he's gone. So tell you what, guys, let's not get discouraged. Let's invent a religion. The last thing you would ever think to do is to say, let's worship a man who's been crucified. You just wouldn't do it. To me... This is one of the most potent arguments for uh, evidence of the resurrection that oftentimes you don't hear about. Uh, but let's go to the next slide if we can, Joseph. This one has to do with 
worshiping Jesus as God. Now to those of us who are Christians, that's not such a surprising thing to hear. But put it in its first century Jewish context, and it's actually an, an, a very uh, amazing fact. Um, Joseph, you'll put up the first quote. The time between the death of Jesus and the fully developed Christology, I'll talk more about that in a moment, which we find in the earliest Christian documents, the letters of Paul, is so short that the development which takes place within it can only be called amazing. Now when he talks about the fully developed Christology, what he's talking about is Jesus being referred to as Son of God, as Messiah, uh, prayers are being lifted up in Jesus' name. Jesus is being called on in worship. He is being praised. And uh, what this quote is saying is that it's just incredible that in such a few short years, Jesus could go from a man who was crucified on a cross to being worshipped as God and to being equated with God. Uh, next uh, quote, please, Joseph. Now this fellow, Larry Hurtado, who by the way is the one who wrote that book, How in the World Did Anyone Become a Christian in the First Three Centuries? He says, I contend that the place of Jesus in the earliest Christian devotional practice, meaning the worship, uh, is in historical terms still more astonishing when viewed in the light of the Jewish concerns to restrict worship to the one God alone. The programmatic place of Jesus in earliest Christian devotion amounts to a novel and historically significant modification. Now, uh, let me explain that to you just very briefly. So, uh, what uh, Dr. Hurtado is saying here is that think about how Christianity was birthed. Who were the people that birthed it? It was the Jews, right? Jesus was a Jew. His early disciples were Jews. They went out proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead to fellow Jews. What do we know about the Jewish people? We know that they were monotheistic. We know that they only worshipped and offered sacrifice to the one true God of Israel. And yet immediately after the resurrection of Jesus, we have Jewish people proclaiming that Jesus is God and worshiping Jesus as God. There's nothing else in Judaism like this. The Jews might revere angels. They might revere certain Old Testament figures like Abraham or Melchizedek, but they didn't offer them sacrifice. They didn't sing praises to their name. Totally different with Jesus. How does that happen? Unless these Jews are convinced that Jesus really did raise from the dead and really is worthy of their worship. Uh, the next quote, please. There were a number of other Jewish sects in the first century, right? We can talk about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, etc. All of them were tolerated amongst the Jews except for the early followers of Jesus. The divine status accorded to Jesus by early Jewish believers explains the persecution of the early church by Saul of Tarsus and by fellow Jews, as mentioned in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. So you have these various Jewish sects, no big deal in the Judaism of the first century. No, you know, Sadducees aren't persecuting Pharisees and, and trying to destroy them all, uh, dragging them out of their synagogues and putting them to death. This isn't happening between other Jewish sects, but it is happening with the early Christians. Why is that? Because they're worshiping Jesus as God. And that is considered by a loyal Jew to be blasphemous. And this, no doubt, is what got the ire of Saul of Tarsus and why he felt like he had to exterminate this sect. Only God is God. Jeez, this Jesus is not God. And so he began to round up the Christians uh, and to have them put to death. So this is just yet another evidence that very early on, Christians are worshiping Jesus as God. And then the last point, please, Joseph, on this slide. These claims and practices are perhaps now so familiar, both to Christian and non-Christians, that their sheer novelty and astonishing character are no longer noticed. That's what I mentioned at the beginning of this slide. We're so used to thinking of Jesus as God, 
And even unbelievers are used to Christians calling Jesus God. We never stop to think about what an extraordinary phenomenon it was that after the resurrection of Jesus, these early Jews who only worshipped the one true God began to worship Jesus as God. What prompted the change? There's nothing else like it in Judaism of that time. Best explanation, it really happened. The resurrection really happened. Now, another uh, unusual um, proof of the resurrection is the idea that Jesus was raised on the third day. And you might wonder, well, you know, what's so strange about that? Because uh, we're familiar with Jesus' predictions um, that the Son of Man would be crucified and killed, and in three days he would rise again. We're used to the gospel accounts um, that he, he died and rose again three days later. Um, well, have you... Uh, I'll tell you what, turn with me first to uh, Mark chapter 9, verses 30 and 32. And so if you'll put that passage up, Joseph, thank you. So Mark 9, 30 through 32. And this is a passage that always puzzled me. Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after he is killed, he will rise the third day. Verse 32, But they did not understand this saying, and were afraid to ask him. And, and whenever I've read that passage before, I'm like, What don't you understand? I'm going to be delivered over to the chief priests and elders. They're going to kill me. In three days, I'm going to rise later. Sounds like plain language to us, doesn't it? The, the catch in, in all of this was Jesus' prediction that he would rise three days later. There was nothing like it in Judaism. And so when the disciples heard it, they didn't have any clue what he was talking about. Um, so uh, you'll put up the next couple there. Uh, so I asked the question, have you ever wondered why the disciples didn't understand Jesus' words here? For those Jews who did believe in a physical resurrection, and remember, not all Jews did. Take the Sadducees, for instance. They didn't even believe in a bodily resurrection. But for those who did, it was thought to only happen at the end of time, in the last day. You remember the story in John chapter 11 where Jesus goes to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he's met by... Lazarus's sisters Mary and Martha and they both say to him "Lo, Lord if you had been here our brother would not have died and uh, Jesus says your brother will rise again and one of the sisters responds and says I know Lord in the last day in the resurrection he will rise again and Jesus said I am the resurrection and the life right he who believes in me though he were dead yet shall he live well, uh, that is a, a, an obvious case of uh, a, a Jew professing belief in bodily resurrection. But when's it going to happen? Not until the, the day of judgment. Not until the end of time. And so there was no strong Jewish understanding or belief in the first century that someone would rise in the midst of history. Um, so the, the next uh, line there, please, Joseph. So why do the Gospels teach this concept that's foreign to the Judaism of Jesus' day? Answer, Jesus must have really taught that he would rise on the third day. Otherwise, there's no explanation for it. Here you are again, you're this little band of disciples meeting together and you're planning to start your own religion, okay? So what are you going to do? Well, the natural human inclination is, let's make this as easy as possible for people to accept and believe. Number one, you start off with a man who's crucified. Okay, that's a bad start. Number two, you're going to worship him as God. How are you going to get your fellow Jews convinced of that one? And number three, you're going to tell them that he raised on the third day in the midst uh, of history when all they can think of is a resurrection at the end of time. So here's yet another new element uh, in, in the formula and you're trying to create this new religion and get everyone to buy in on it. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, the final point, good, thank you, Joseph. 
One could have defended Jesus and his future uh, and his identity by simply saying, well, when the resurrection comes at the end of history, Jesus will run the judgment. He will be raised and exalted and run the judgment. That would be how to do it on the basis of Jewish precedent and expectation. You wouldn't need a resurrection in the midst of history, as Professor Daryl Bach. So again, something else very unusual to add into the mix of this new belief system. Uh, the next page, please, Joseph. Now here's one that a lot of people are somewhat familiar with, but uh, perhaps not to uh, a great extent. We know that when Gentiles began to come into the church, there was some conflict, wasn't there? Uh, conflict over whether they had to keep the full law of Moses, conflict over table fellowship because Gentiles ate certain unclean foods that the Jews wouldn't eat and so on. So we're aware that there was some ethnic conflict as Gentiles began coming into the church in the first century. Um, but if you'll put up the first point there, Joseph. But what you may not be aware of is that in a 200 year period from 100 BC to 100 AD there were four waves of ethnic violence that occurred specifically between Jews and Greeks. Now Greeks are simply people who've adopted the Greek way of living and the Greek language. So it's not just people living in Greece. So we often refer to people like this as Gentiles. So whether you want to use the word Greek or use the word Gentile. The point is, is that throughout the empire, there were these waves of ethnic violence. Think mobs, think rioting taking place. Uh, think of the rioting that happened in Paris a few years ago. Uh, think of some of the riots that have happened in the United States over the past few years between black and white. Uh, think of the rioting that goes on today in Israel between uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. Think of the ethnic uh, animosity that exists between modern Israelis and Arabs. And you get an idea of the type of uh, animosity and conflict that was going on in the first century between Jews and Gentiles. Now the amazing thing about this is again if you're starting a new religion you want to get your Jewish brothers on board and your Jewish sisters on board because you're Jewish. Why in the world do you want to go to the trouble to spread this new religion to a people that you probably hate and you spent your whole life trying to have not a whole lot to do with? <laughs> Now, there were various cities throughout the empire where ethnic violence broke out uh, during the time of Paul. One of those cities, 38 AD, was the city of Antioch. Guess where Barnabas goes and brings Paul to? He goes to Tarsus and he brings Paul to Antioch in the early 40s. Now, the city of Antioch has just seen all of this ethnic violence. Jews killing Greeks, Greeks killing Jews. And as they're praying and ministering to the Lord in Acts 13 verse 1, we're told that the Holy Spirit says, set aside Saul and Barnabas for me for the work that I have for them. And these two very good Jewish fellows are called to preach the gospel to who? To Gentiles. It's the beginning of the first missionary journey that Paul takes. So in this world of ethnic conflict and violence, God sends these Jewish men out to convert Gentiles. Mm -hmm. How well do you think that's going to be received? This is a really, really tough assignment and call that God places on the Apostle Paul. And it's not something that would come humanly or naturally. These are people that Paul as a Pharisee would have tried to stay separate and apart from. And now he's not only teaching them about Jesus, but he's inviting them into congregations where there's other Jewish believers and he's standing up for them and saying, no, 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 they don't have to be circumcised. They don't have to follow the law of Moses. They don't have to ob observe our clean and unclean uh, food laws. We just welcome them in as brothers and sisters because we share a common faith in Jesus Christ. That's radical. That's incredible. And it's not something that you would ever imagine. Someone who was raised a Pharisee, according to the strict manner of the law, as Paul himself says, it's not something that you would imagine an individual like that uh, ever doing. 
So once again, this whole idea of, of ethnic conflict in the first century uh, makes it even more incredible that, that the gospel could, could succeed. Uh, let me throw up a few quotes here, uh, Joseph. So, raised in a Greek city of Asia Minor, right? Tarsus. Paul would have been aware of the anti-Jewish sentiments of many Greeks in the eastern Mediterranean basin and perhaps suffered himself. Uh, next quote from the same person. Both Jewish, Jewish and Greek converts brought heavy loads of ethnic prejudice with them into the new Christian house churches. Yeah, no kidding. We see that reflected in the pages of the New Testament, don't we? And now, understanding this background of the ethnic conflict that was going on, it makes even more sense uh, why as the Gentiles came into the church, there was a lot of discomfort on both sides. Um, Notice uh, the, the famous story in Acts chapter 10 that Peter himself, uh, when he was bringing the gospel to the Gentiles, it took a divine revelation. You know, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything clean or unclean. And then he says, God has taught me to call no man common or unclean. But it took a divine revelation. Again, it's not the kind of mindset that a Jewish believer would have had in the first century. And so the explanation of the gospel going out to the Gentile world, if it's man-made, it really has no logical explanation. It had to ha happen by divine revelation. Okay, the, so the next slide. So as Paul and uh, others begin to take the gospel to the Greco-Roman world, uh, they run into another stumbling block, another problem. So if you put up the first... Uh, line there, Joseph. One of the challenges facing early Christians proclaiming the gospel to Gentiles was not only that the cross was considered a shameful death, but also that the Greeks and Romans did not believe in a physical resurrection. Uh, the next point, please. The bulk of the Greco-Roman hope has no resurrection in it. You either died and your body decomposed and there was no hope whatsoever, or there was a belief in some type of immortality of the soul, a spiritual form of resurrection, but no physical dimensions to it whatsoever. And so Greco-Romans either had immortality of the soul or you died at death. So the resurrection would be a completely new concept, a problematic concept for a lot of the Greco-Romans. We have an example of this in Acts chapter 17 and verse 32. You remember when Paul is in Athens and he goes to speak on the Areopagus there. Uh, and we're told at the conclusion of his message in verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Why did they mock? Because again, in the Greco-Roman world, there was no concept of a physical bodily resurrection. So again, if you're making up a religion you got another strike against you. Because as you move out into the Gentile world, you're going to be teaching something that is absolutely contrary to anything that they believe. Okay, so the next slide. Now this one you may have heard of before. It's becoming more popular to mention this one. This is the idea of women as witnesses in the ancient world. Um, the, the first point, Joseph, please. <laughs> So each of the Gospels testifies that women were the first to see and proclaim the resurrection. So go to the resurrection accounts in every one of the Gospels, and Mary Magdalene and a few other ladies are mentioned as being the first ones to see the risen Lord. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, the next point. It's very important to appreciate how crucial this idea is because in the culture of the time, women could not be witnesses and were viewed and were not viewed as credible witnesses. Okay? have a few quotes here from you. Uh, the first quote comes from uh, Josephus, ancient Jewish historian in the late first century. Here's what he has to say, ladies. But let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. Sorry, ladies. 
But the Talmud is even harsher. The Talmud or is that compilation of Jewish teachings. It's not compiled until a few centuries later, but a lot of these ideas go back to the first century. And it says any evidence that a woman gives is not valid. So here are the early Christians proclaiming Jesus being raised from the dead. And people are saying, how do you know? And they say, well, the women told us. <laughs> Okay, right there, you've struck out again, okay? Because women are not considered credible witnesses in the first century. So, um, why would you say it? Well, there's only one reason that you would say it. If they really were the first witnesses to the resurrection, you wouldn't make something like that up. You'd get some credible man and say he was the first one to see the risen Jesus. Oh, okay, well, you know, we know Peter. Maybe we can take his word for it. So um, here, here is yet a, another poor, poor plan if in fact the early disciples are trying to invent a new religion. Um, next point. This one is called the criterion of embarrassment. And this has to do with the fact that there are many passages uh, in the Gospels that put the disciples in a very poor and embarrassing light. So, um, the criterion of embarrassment is one of the standards used to determine whether something is historical or not. Um, next point, Joseph. For example, if you were making something up, like a new religion that you wanted others to accept, you would want to put all of the leaders and their actions in the best light possible. You would certainly not want to tell stories that might discredit them. So, in the Gospels, we've got Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples, and, and we're constantly reading about uh, how they don't understand Jesus, uh, and how they're doing all sorts of things, like um, Jesus, uh, Peter is uh, uh, denying Jesus uh, in the gar at the Garden of Gethsemane, or when he's on trial, the, all the disciples are falling asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, just after Jesus confesses himself to be the Christ and proclaims that he's going to be killed and raised three days later in Mark chapter 8 verse 33, Peter says, Lord, these things aren't going to happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Right? So here you have the leader of the new movement being called Satan by Jesus himself. When the women come to proclaim the resurrection to the disciples, Luke 24 tells us that none of them believed it. Again, going to believe a bunch of women. They're not credible witnesses, right? So even the disciples, when they first hear it, do not believe. These are not the kind of stories that you would put in a written account and spread around for everyone to hear about if you want to establish the credibility of your leadership. Follow Peter, follow James, follow John. Why? Because they're a bunch of goof-ups. And they do everything wrong. They misunderstand. They get rebuked by Jesus. They get called Satan. Yeah, follow them. It's crazy, isn't it? The only reason you write stories like this is because they must have happened. And the great thing about early Christians, they told the truth, whether it made them look good or whether it made them look not so good. So, the next point, and this is a quote by our friend uh, Dr. Daryl Bach, who we've had a few quotes from here. He, he sizes it up this way. So you're in a PR meeting, and this is going to be uh, the case you're going to make. I'll tell you how we keep hope alive. Let's talk about a resurrection, because Judaism expects a physical resurrection. Let's talk about a resurrection in the midst of history. That's a new idea. And let's sell that idea, which is an unpopular idea. Greco-Romans don't have it. Let's sell that idea by having our first witnesses be people who culturally don't count as witnesses. You would never make up the story this way if it were made up. So, in summary and conclusion, let me go over these uh, points again one by one. And I think each one of them in, in, in and of themselves are powerful evidence for the resurrection. But when you put all of these together that we've covered this morning, plus all the other arguments that you find in a book like More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel's book, A Case for Christ, the evidence for, for the resurrection is just overwhelming. So number one, we have the 
whole, whole idea of honor and shame. And in the first century world, you want to avoid shame at all costs. And yet here are the early disciples identifying with the cross of Jesus and boldly proclaiming uh, that he is their savior. Number two is the divine status accorded to Jesus by early Jewish worshipers. Oh yeah, if we had some Gentiles from the very beginning worshiping Jesus as God, we'd say, well, that's not unusual. They believe in all kinds of gods, but not so the Jews. So it's extremely unusual. Number three, resurrection on the third day. Totally new concept. Number four, the ethnic conflict between Jews and Greeks. Next, Greco-Roman beliefs. There is no such thing as a physical bodily resurrection. Next, women as witnesses who are not considered credible in the first century. And then finally, the criterion of embarrassment. Look at the goofballs we have as leaders. Now, when you put all of that together, if Christianity was a man-made religion, if it was made up by the early disciples, boy, were they dumb. Because they did everything that was countercultural. They did everything that went against everything they would have thought and believed and did it the wrong way and yet somehow, oops, by accident, Christianity still succeeded? It just doesn't make sense. The most uh, viable testimony is the testimony of Scripture. That Jesus did in fact raise from the dead and that the accounts that are given uh, are factual and that it was uh, made evidenced both by Jesus appearing to many people and it was made evidenced by the early church through the signs and wonders that were performed. So let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 2 through 5. I just want to conclude with a couple of uh, passages of scripture here. So um, 1 Corinthians 2 beginning with verse 2. Words of the Apostle Paul. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Such incredible words that I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ uh, and him crucified. Words coming from the mouth of a first century man, absolutely astounding. And then the last slide there, Joseph, we'll just look at this passage together from 1 Corinthians 1.18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Given the context of honor and shame and all the other cultural things that we've mentioned, the cross was indeed a message of foolishness. Foolishness. How could have it succeeded? Only one way, by the power of God.